A woman was found dead in her own apartment, and from the very beginning of the investigation, the case was very strange. The only serious clue was a bite left by the attacker on the victim's body. It took the police over 20 years to finally uncover the horrifying truth, but such a turn of events caused a lot of dissatisfaction and criticism, as no one expected such an outcome. Sherry Rasmussen was born on February 7, 1957, in the state of Washington. She grew up in a large and friendly family with two sisters and loving parents. Later, they moved to the city of Tucson, Arizona, where Sherry attended the local school. She was an excellent student and even finished elementary school a year ahead of her peers. Sherry completed the entire 7th grade program on summer vacation by herself. After graduating from high school in 1973, she enrolled in a California college where her older sister was already studying. In her first year, Sherry decided to pursue a medical education and become a nurse, for which she had to take additional courses at another institution. After graduating from college in 1975, Sherry decided to get a master's degree at the University of California, Los Angeles and also worked there as a nurse to pay for her education. After receiving her master's degree at the age of 23, her father bought her an apartment in the suburbs of Los Angeles. But Sherry did not want to live off her parents, so she wrote her father a check every month for the entire amount of the mortgage payments. She also got a job at a local hospital, heading the nursing department for caring for seriously ill people. In May 1984, when Sherry was 27 years old, she met a man named John Rutten. They immediately hit it off and the couple started dating. John had a good education, worked as a computer engineer, and was a very intelligent young man. A year later, the couple decided to get married and after that, John moved in to Sherry's apartment. The newlyweds spent their honeymoon in Jamaica, after which they returned home to celebrate Christmas with Sherry's family. It seemed that this couple was destined for a happy and carefree future. On February 24th of the following year, when John was getting ready for work as usual, Sherry complained of feeling unwell and decided to stay home. She asked John to call her in a few hours. At around 7.20 a.m., John left for work. Closer to 10 a.m., John tried to reach her by phone, but she didn't answer. Half an hour later, he tried again, but still no answer. So he called her workplace to check if she had gone to work, but Sherry hadn't shown up at the hospital either. Her sister also tried to reach her, but without success. John returned home from work at around 6 p.m. and immediately noticed something strange. The garage door was open, even though he had closed it in the morning, and Sherry's car was missing. Therefore, he first thought that she had gone somewhere. As he approached the garage, he saw a lot of broken glass and immediately discovered its source. There was a small balcony above the garage with a glass door which had been smashed. He entered the house through the garage and to his horror found Sherry there. She was lying on the floor, her body badly disfigured. John immediately called the police and detectives began to examine the crime scene. In all the rooms, there was complete chaos. Broken vases, overturned furniture, scattered items. A bloody handprint was found on the wall next to the alarm button. Apparently, the victim tried to reach it, but failed. In addition to extensive bruises and wounds, experts noticed a human bite mark on Sherry's wrist. Apart from all of the above, the marks on her hands indicated that the attacker tied up the victim before untying her. The cause of death was three close-range gunshot wounds. Detectives found a blanket with bullet holes in the apartment and concluded that the attacker wrapped the gun in it to muffle the sound of the shots. Detectives immediately concluded that there was a prolonged struggle between the attacker and Sherry. This was evidenced by the amount of scattered and broken items throughout the apartment, as well as a bloody mark next to the alarm button. The lead investigator quickly concluded that they were dealing with a failed robbery. According to his opinion, at least two criminals broke into Sherry's apartment, 
but they didn't expect her to be home. A struggle ensued between them and Sherry fought for her life until the end. Several facts supported the robbery version. Firstly, Sherry's car disappeared from the garage. Secondly, someone had placed the stereo equipment and player next to the staircase leading to the second floor. According to the police, the robbers wanted to take them and leave, but after the scuffle and murder, they fled the scene. However, there were some dubious moments in this version. Firstly, the police did not find any signs of forced entry. This meant that either Sherry let the criminals in herself, or they had a key. Secondly, the perpetrators did not touch absolutely all the valuable items, including the jewelry box standing in plain sight. Detectives interviewed all of Sherry's neighbors, but it didn't yield any new leads. Some residents heard the sounds of a struggle, but not gunshots. They also didn't see anyone entering the woman's apartment. Experts took blood samples and fingerprints from the house, but they couldn't conduct DNA analysis in 1985. The lead investigator also took a piece of cotton and soaked it in the trace of the bite on Sherry's body. He hoped that the attacker's saliva could be left behind, and eventually, experts could use this clue to catch the killer. After a thorough search of the apartment, detectives learned one interesting fact. It turned out that the criminals took only one thing, Sherry and John's marriage certificate. This was very strange and also raised suspicions about the man himself, but his alibi was unquestionable. John was at work until the evening, and he simply couldn't have committed this crime. Moreover, he himself told the police about the disappearance of this document. Detectives were unable to find an explanation for this strange fact. After a week and a half, they found Sherry's car in a parking lot four kilometers from her apartment. It was unlocked and the keys were in the ignition. Forensic experts tried to find fingerprints, but they were unsuccessful. Either the criminals only touched it with gloves on, or they wiped away all the fingerprints. Two months after the murder, that took place just a few hundred meters from Sherry's home, a robbery occurred. Detectives immediately found many similarities. Two criminals broke into a stranger's apartment through the garage, threatened the owner with a gun, and stole stereo equipment. The lead investigator immediately thought that these two were behind the woman's murder, so the police tried to find them. From witness accounts, they created approximate composite sketches of the suspects and also learned that both men were Latino, but they were never found. However, investigators did not show much interest in getting to the truth, which constantly irritated Sherry's parents. Her father regularly went to the police station, inquired about the progress of the investigation, and asked the detectives to consider different versions. Once, he even asked them to take a closer look at John's ex-girlfriend, Stephanie Lazarus, who was a police officer herself. Sherry had told her father several times that she was obsessed with John, but the investigators only laughed at this version. They told him to watch fewer detective shows. The thing was that Stephanie couldn't accept John's departure. Learning that he was going to marry another woman, she came to Sherry's workplace. Stephanie told her that their marriage was doomed and that she and John would be together again sooner or later. In addition, she said that John had slept with her already after becoming engaged to Sherry. Of course, after this visit, Sherry was deeply upset. Upon returning home, she told John what had happened, and he admitted that he had indeed slept with Stephanie. After she found out about his engagement, the young woman begged him to come over, spoke of her love, and urged him to return to her. But he said he loved Sherry and intended to marry her. Then, Stephanie offered to sleep with him one last time, and John agreed. He apologized to Sherry and said it was a huge mistake on his part. The woman forgave him, and this incident with Stephanie gradually faded away. But the story didn't end there. Stephanie came to their home several times without warning under various pretexts. Once, she came with a set of skis and announced that John promised to wax them for her. The next time she entered their apartment when the man was not at home. Sherry did not even hear how she entered the room and was shocked to see Stephanie in her living room. 
When asked what she was doing there, the woman said she came to talk to John. Sherry had a hard time convincing her to leave. Later, she even thought of going to the police about this incident, but did not. The woman was afraid that if she told about the harassment by their own employee, they would just laugh at her. She also wondered how Stephanie managed to enter the residential complex. It was surrounded by a high fence, and a special pass was required to enter. Apparently, the woman used her police badge and the security let her in. As for Stephanie's apartment, there had to be a duplicate key. Otherwise, she simply could not have entered without breaking the lock. In addition to this, Sherry repeatedly noticed that someone was following her. Once, she and John were sitting in a restaurant, and the woman saw someone staring at them intently. As soon as she looked at this person, he immediately left. Sherry did not see his face because it was covered with a hood. Unknown calls, also regularly, came to their home phone, and Sherry suspected it could be Stephanie. The victim's father told detectives about all these incidents, but they did not attach any importance to his words. They were sure that the murder was committed by the two Mexicans who robbed an apartment near Sherry's home. Three months after the murder, something interesting happened. Some documents from Sherry's case disappeared from the police station. Among them were records of detectives about the progress of the investigation. They had to record almost every step related to the investigation of this crime. But at one point, the police simply could not find these journals. However, there were no important leads there anyway. Since then, the case has been hanging for years. Detectives did not show much desire to look for new leads, despite constant pressure from Sherry's parents. Eight months after the murder, Sherry's father offered a reward of $10,000 for any information that would help find the perpetrator. A year later, he held a press conference where he again promised a reward for information, but in both cases, it yielded no results. Seven years later, the lead investigator on the case retired. The victim's father decided to meet with his successor, hoping that he would take his job more seriously. Additionally, it was 1993 and DNA analysis technology was already being actively used by the police to solve crimes. Sherry's father asked the detective to perform such an analysis and even offered to fully pay for it. However, the detective stated that it was pointless since they did not have a single suspect with whom to compare the obtained DNA profile. Meanwhile, John started a new family, but at some point, he reunited with Stephanie. They planned to go to Hawaii together, but something unusual happened before that. The man called the detective and asked if they had any new evidence indicating Stephanie's involvement in the murder. Apparently, he himself suspected that the woman might have done something like that. However, all these years, he was afraid to talk about it, although this did not prevent him from sleeping with her again. As for Stephanie herself, she was quickly climbing the career ladder in the police department. She received higher ranks, twice became detective of the year, and had an impeccable reputation. She also married another police officer, but this did not prevent her from regularly sleeping with John. In 2001, a separate unit was formed in Los Angeles to work on unsolved murders. They were given Sherry's case along with thousands of similar cases and the detectives began sorting through them gradually. They briefly studied each case, trying to understand which ones had the greatest chance of being solved. For example, murders without any clues were pushed to the end of the queue, and cases with DNA samples of possible suspects were marked as the most promising. Sherry's murder made it onto this list because among the evidence was a piece of cotton that could have contained the perpetrator's saliva left behind after a bite. Two years later, detectives picked up the case and sent all available evidence to the laboratory. Due to high demand, they had to wait almost two years for the results until January 2005. Among the evidence were nail fragments and blood samples from the apartment. All of them contained only Sherry's DNA and the forensic scientists only had to study the sample from the bite mark on her body. The problem was that they couldn't find the vial with this evidence for a whole day until they finally discovered it by the wall of a large refrigerator. 
After studying the sample, experts found foreign DNA belonging to an unknown woman. This profile was immediately run through the FBI database, but it wasn't there. Detectives speculated that this woman could have committed the robbery with another criminal, or two female robbers could have broken into Sherry's apartment. The investigators still believed that the murder occurred during a robbery. Therefore, they didn't consider any other versions. After they failed to find any new leads in this direction, the case was put on hold. This continued until February 2009, when a new detective took up Sherry's case and began studying the materials left by other investigators. Seeing that DNA from another woman was found at the bite mark on the victim's body, he questioned the robbery version. Detectives considered that the motives for this crime could be completely different, so they decided to compile a list of all the women who could potentially be related to Sherry's murder. As a result, they managed to collect five names. Among them was Stephanie, the victim's colleague at work and three other young women. The detectives initially doubted Stephanie's involvement, considering her reputation and successful career in the police. For this reason, he first decided to check the other suspects. Together with other investigators, they fairly quickly concluded that three women from this list had no connection to Sherry's death. They lacked motives and had alibis. After that, they began to investigate the nurse who worked with Sherry. The case file stated that they had rather tense relations and the police secretly obtained a sample of her DNA from the trash she threw away. Experts extracted the profile and found that it didn't match the saliva found at the bite mark location. Thus, the detectives had only one suspect left, Stephanie. He and several colleagues agreed to keep this information secret until they could obtain solid evidence or disprove this theory. None of them wanted to accuse a police officer with an impeccable reputation of murder, and Stephanie could easily ruin their careers using her connections. They began secretly gathering information on her, trying to find any connection to the murder. Interestingly, the woman worked in the same building on the same floor as them. Because of this, the investigators had to take many precautions and not even mention her name in their notes. Soon, the detectives discovered the first interesting fact. During the years of the murder, Stephanie owned a 38 caliber revolver, the same type of gun that was used to shoot Sherry. They also learned that the victim had repeatedly complained about strange and even aggressive behavior from Stephanie. The fact that the police officer came to Sherry's workplace in her uniform and said rude things to her seemed suspicious. Even more suspicion was added by the fact that Stephanie had broken into Sherry's gated community and even into her apartment several times. After analyzing the reports and photos from the crime scene, the detectives concluded that the possible robbery seemed staged. Nothing was taken from the apartment, not even the valuable items that were prominently displayed, but instead only a player and stereo were taken away. Moreover, the shooter had to be well-versed in how the gun worked. In extreme conditions, he was able to wrap the gun barrel with a blanket in such a way that the neighbors did not hear a single shot. It is unlikely that a low-level thief of players could possess such skills, but a trained and experienced police officer could. Another fact indicating Stephanie's involvement was a stolen marriage registration certificate found in her apartment. Why would some random burglars look for this document and take it with them, leaving a whole box of jewelry behind. But for Stephanie, it could have had a significant symbolic value. Perhaps killing Sherry was not enough for her, or she had planned to break into her apartment only for this document, but the woman caught her in the act. In the end, the detectives learned that two weeks after the murder, Stephanie came to the police station and filed a report of theft. According to this information, Someone had broken into her car, which was left near the pier, and stolen several items, including a sports bag, clothes, videotapes, and a 38 caliber revolver. Given all the facts presented, the moment with the gun seemed very suspicious. 
Detectives suspected that she intentionally got rid of the weapon, disguising it as a theft. Furthermore, she filed a report at a different police station where nobody knew her, which seemed very strange since her colleagues would have taken the case with the utmost responsibility. As a result, the detectives decided to obtain a DNA sample from Stephanie. Several officers undercover followed her for a week until they finally had the opportunity to get it. On May 28, 2009, Stephanie and her stepdaughter stopped at a cafe for a snack. As soon as they left, the officers took the glass she drank from and sent it to the lab. The next day, the result was ready. A full match. Despite the many factors pointing to Stephanie's involvement, the detectives were still shocked. It was hard for them to believe that a high-ranking and respected police officer was connected to the murder, but the DNA results were indisputable. However, at that moment, they did not have time for these thoughts, and investigators began developing a plan to arrest her. None of them wanted to do this in the middle of the police station, in front of hundreds of officers. Moreover, Stephanie had extensive connections, and the detectives decided to lure her away from prying eyes. The chief of the Los Angeles Police Department was unofficially informed that one of his subordinates was suspected of the murder. The chief ordered the detectives not to approach Stephanie while she had her service or personal weapon with her. He also considered the idea of arresting her in her own home risky since she lived with her husband and stepdaughter. The detectives began to think about how to get the person who outranked them to surrender their weapon. And soon, they had an excellent idea. In the basement of the police department, there were holding cells designed for temporary detention of criminals. So anyone entering there had to surrender their weapon. To lure her there, a legend was created. Stephanie had extensive experience working in the department that dealt with art thefts. Therefore, on June 5, 2009, Two detectives with hidden microphones approached her and asked for help. They said they had arrested a suspect who may have some information about stolen paintings. The detectives admitted that they were not familiar with all the details and needed the help of an experienced professional. Stephanie agreed and went with them to the basement where the suspect was supposed to be held. After the woman surrendered her weapon, they went to the interrogation room, but there was no suspect there. Instead, the detectives gradually and very carefully laid out the cards on the table, asking Stephanie questions about Sherry's murder. At first, they simply said that they needed to ask her a few questions about an old case related to her ex-boyfriend. Over the course of an hour, they smoothly led the dialogue to a discussion of the murder itself, but Stephanie said that she hardly remembered Sherry as it was all a long time ago. Finally, the detectives announced that they had obtained the killer's DNA and asked Stephanie to provide her DNA sample for comparison. At that point, the woman immediately said that she was not going to give her DNA, refused to talk further without a lawyer, and decided to leave. The detectives let her go, but several policemen with handcuffs were waiting for Stephanie at the end of the corridor. 23 years after the murder, the woman was arrested considering Stephanie's vast police experience, all attempts to talk to her during interrogations led to no results. She knew the situation perfectly. There was DNA evidence against her, found at the bite mark on the victim's body, and it was extremely difficult to dispute this evidence. Nevertheless, she denied her involvement and insisted on her innocence. As a result, the detectives had no choice but to prepare documents for the transfer to court. Over the next few years, Stephanie was held in a woman's prison until the first hearings began in 2012. It took the police three years to basically rebuild the case from scratch. Because their predecessors blindly believed in a failed robbery, it was necessary to redo all the materials and focus specifically on Stephanie. At the trial, the woman continued to insist on her innocence. Her lawyer questioned the DNA test results and also pointed out that there were no suspicions against Stephanie during the initial investigation, but all these arguments turned out to be completely unconvincing. The prosecution believed that on that day, 
Stephanie waited for John to leave for work and entered Sherry's apartment. She went upstairs, shot Sherry once, but Sherry managed to resist and a struggle ensued, which moved downstairs. Ultimately, Stephanie killed her, staged a riot in the apartment, creating an illusion of a burglary. She then found a marriage certificate and left the scene. After her arrest, detectives discovered that Stephanie had boasted to colleagues about her lock-picking set, and they found several books on how to pick locks in her home. This could explain how she entered the apartment without leaving any traces of a break-in. A lock of not the best quality can be picked with lockpicks so that no expert will notice any traces. The trial ended on March 8, 2012, and the jury found Stephanie guilty of murder. She received a sentence ranging from 27 years to life in prison, as well as an additional two years for using a service weapon. The judge deducted a thousand days from her sentence, citing the time spent behind bars awaiting trial and her good behavior. Sherry's parents tried to sue the detectives who originally worked the case, despite the fact that the victim's father had been telling them to look at Stephanie from the very beginning, they ignored his words. This raises a reasonable question. Were they deliberately covering up their colleague, or did they really not believe in her involvement? In the first case, it would have been a serious crime, and in the second case, it would have been simple negligence and ignoring significant facts. Unfortunately, the statute of limitations had expired in this case, and the court refused to prosecute these police officers. As for Stephanie, she filed an appeal immediately after the trial, but it was quickly rejected. She still denies her guilt while behind bars. At present, she is 62 years old and can file a petition for early release only in 2039. Sherry's ex-husband, John, lost interest in investigating her murder. Almost immediately after it happened, he started a new family, slept with Stephanie for a while, and later moved to another city. Detectives questioned his involvement, but this version seems unlikely. Most likely, he did not know about his ex-wife's plans. Thus, this case could have been gathering dust in archives to this day if it hadn't fallen into the hands of professional detectives. Everyone who worked on it before refused to even consider the version of their colleague's involvement. Share your opinion about this story in the comments, and don't forget to give a like if you enjoyed the video. Thank you for watching.